I apologize for my voice today. Uh, it's amazing what some elm tree dust can do for your sinuses. When you get out mowing and bush hogging uh, this time of year. Um, so I had this sponsor in my church. Um, his name was Bob. And um, I thought he was an energetic guy. I thought he was a lot of fun. I thought he was a great deacon and a youth sponsor. And we had a trip where we took 150 kids to the mountains every year for a camping trip. And I wanted to get the bus ready. He said, bring over to my house, I'll get it ready. So I go over to check on the bus and um, it's laying in pieces in his front yard. I mean, and I'm not talking about, I mean, this guy took seats out and cleaned them. This guy took parts of the engine out and it's laying it. Yeah, I mean, like, it's in pieces. I, this isn't just a standard oil change and an air filter. This is a major overhaul and we're leaving tomorrow morning. And I'm thinking, this is, this is not good. I like this guy. I think he's wonderful. I didn't know he used to be a race car mechanic. I didn't know he was a perfectionist. I didn't know that when I said I'd like to have the bus ready to go, he meant ready to go. Like I'm gonna take it apart, clean it, and put it back together again, and it'll never run the same again. And I'm thinking, that doesn't work when I do stuff like that. I can get it apart. Um, and, and I was worried. Wow, that vehicle never ran better. He was the kind of guy that he would walk up beside you and, how she sound now? Wait till you step on the gas tomorrow morning. And, and you're like, wow, Bob, what's that sound? I changed the mufflers. You know, it's like, you did what? Oh, yeah, I got this baby purring. It did things it had never done before. I think it even peeled out when I stepped on the gas, and it was loaded with 45 kids. Smoked the tires. Bob's back there going, yeah. I mean, he, he even, no, I'm not kidding. This is, I'm not joking. You think I never tell the truth. But... I mean, he, he got out there and he sanded it down and polished and, and waxed it, the whole bus, after he was done tuning it up. He didn't want it to sound good, he wanted it to look good. He goes, what about that paint job? That's shiny. Haven't washed it in about five years. <laughs> Never waxed it. <laughs> I mean, that's the kind of guy he was. And, you know, I've been talking about becoming a Christian and living the Christian life and certain qualities that ought to exist in a Christian's life. One of them is service. And you got to remember, there are certain people that they fish on the edge of the pond. And there are certain people, when they become Christians, they jump in the middle of the pond. There's no looking back. And some people, they, they're a little hem hoy about how they're going to serve God there's other people, they give God everything they've got. And Bob was one of those kind of guys that if I'm going to be a Christian, if I'm going to serve the Lord, if I'm going to be a deacon, I'm going to give him every percent of what I got when I do something for the church or for God. At every board meeting, there'd be about 20 or 30 deacons in the room. They'd start the board meeting, he would say, I have something to put on the agenda, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I propose that we dismiss. Uh, Bob, we haven't got started yet. I know, wouldn't that be great? Let's go home. I'm happy with the church. You're happy with the church? Let's go home. You're kind of guy, Curtis. <clears throat> but, you know, this morning, you know, we've been off on a lot of subjects about what's going on in the world right now, and we, we've covered it. We beat it pretty good. We've talked last week about what it means to be a Christian. And I'd like to thank the Bob Georges 
You know, there's a lot of people that do a lot of stuff for us to have church. I mean, Fane, he, I, I think sometimes all the music and all the practicing and all the work and all the equipment and, and all the sound and uh, I, I've never heard Fane complain. And, and we sure would miss it if it wasn't going on. And you can travel around the country and we have some awful good music and we've been very blessed. And we've lost people that we thought we would never replace and sure enough, God takes care of it. And uh, I'm thankful for the people that clean our bathrooms. Yeah, there's people up here that dive in. There's people do it while you're in church. Uh, there's people running around with the plungers trying to get it ready. Setting up church and getting it ready and mopping the floors and sweeping the floors and cleaning the bathrooms and cleaning the kitchen and people fixing things when they don't work and um, I'm so thankful for the people that do that for coming up here and I don't know how many years Bob and Anita have helped get communion ready for church uh, and just always are doing it. Um, uh, it it's just you know having coffee ready and having donuts ready I, I remember one time when Quaid was little and we, for some reason we couldn't have donuts. They just weren't here. He'd come up here and no donuts? No. Well, then what, then what do we have in church for? <laughs> you could see the look. Uh, I mean, if we ain't going to have no donuts, I'm going home. <laughs> you know? And I, I got so cracked up by that. But Christianity is about doing something. It never, Christianity never was designed to do what we do. Did you realize? It never was designed to do this, but we do it. To come in, sit down and sing, listen, fall asleep, wake up, get home, and go home and eat lunch. That, that was not the design. Christianity is a doing thing. It was to go in the pond, become a Christian, give your life to Jesus, get work gloves, go out and be a Bob George. Start doing something. Building the body of Christ. Putting it together. Building the house of God. It never was designed to do what we do. That's why sometimes we get tired of it. Because this isn't really what God wanted us to do. He wanted us to go do something. To build the body of Christ. Every Christian ought to have a job to do. And they ought to be doing places. I mean, the only song I know over here is I dropped my dolly in the dirt. And she said it really hurt. I, that's the only song I know. But you could watch someone play the piano all day long, but you wouldn't know how to play the piano because you never put your fingers on the keys. If they said, hey, come up here and play, you've been watching me. Well, no, I, I, I've never touched the keys. I don't know how to play. And shamefully in Christianity, that's what we have a lot of the time. I don't know what to do because I've never had my fingers on the keys. We, it's a doing place to do things. When you look in Ephesians chapter 4, it says this beginning in verse 11. It was he who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ." We were always taught in Bible college, my job, honestly, is to work myself out of a job. My job is to go to a church and teach people how to do everything that I do and then leave and go do it somewhere else. 
and that you would continue with what I taught you to do. God gave all of us the equipment to do certain things to build up the body of Christ. You can see it in the music industry. The reason God gave people Adele, Alan Jackson, a wonderful voice, was not for their own entertainment. He gave them a voice to build up the body of Christ. He gave us a gift to be used to build his kingdom, to be used for that purpose. And we will never have a fulfillment in life until we use the gift that God gave us to build up his church. That's why it was given, not for our own profession or not for own glorification, but to build other people up with what he has shared with us. Bob George, man, he was a motivating guy. Him and another guy on that same trip, no kidding, this is a true story. Jay Rodney, the, my mentor, Bob, we got all these kids camping out, 150 kids. You hear the zipper on the tent come open at 5 in the morning. They, hey, Mike, get up. Got biscuits and gravy out of here going. Here's a cup of coffee. And these other guys in my tent were going, am I dreaming? Or did they just come to your tent and bring you coffee? they like, I'm going to go, I want them to go home to my church. I'm taking those guys home with, I said, no, you're not. They go to my church. I mean, it was just amazing. I mean, they saw their job, is, even on a camping trip, to, I'm going to serve God to the, everybody else is going to envy how we do this. We're going to have the best bus, the best group, the best food. I mean, and they were ornery too. I know they had a jar of jalapenos and they served stew to all the kids and I went by and that jar was empty I said you didn't oh yeah we did and not one of them have complained (laughs) I mean you know they had fun with it uh, serving the Lord and it and for me as a minister it made my job enjoyable but isn't that what the body of Christ is supposed to be to build one another upon love and enjoy what we do and have fun with it, serving the Lord. Listen, being in the pond and being with a father and son getting baptized last night, I can't think of a better way to have a great time. It was a wonderful evening. We are supposed to use what we have to build up the body of Christ. So that when you mention what you do, people say, oh, you know, I've been there. I really enjoyed that. I've been a part of it. Yeah, that's, I enjoy that. That's fun. I I like that fellowship. I like that music. I like the time that they have together. But listen, this is just the beginning of a servant that calls himself a Christian. Bob George would come up to you at church and he would say, "And, and this is a church of a couple thousand people. He'd walk up to you, hey, Carl, <clears throat> when's the last time you tuned your truck up? Not very often. Bring it to my house. He had a car shop set up like you see on TV. You go over, he said, leave it this afternoon. You'd go over there, get your car from Bob. You'd, you'd have to be careful not to get a ticket pulling out. He'd go, it'll run now, won't it? That old bugger had never run that good. Man, here's what I did to it. I mean, like, you did what? He goes, man, I went through that sucker. and Boy, it needed plugs and wires, and I flushed the radiator and, and checked your transmission fluid. And, and, and you're just like, what I owe you? You don't owe me nothing. I love working on them. He'd come up to you at church say, when's the last time you changed the line in your fishing reel. He made custom rods for people to go fishing. Sold them. He said, bring that rod over. I'll put some new string on it. I said, Bob, it's never had new string on it. Well, bring it over here. I'm still using 
the ones he did. And I haven't done them since. This is the good one. He would say, when's the last time you sharpened the blades on your lawnmower? Bring that thing over to my house. Because his son, every week you mow this way, next week you got to mow this way. He wouldn't let him do it the same way twice. He said, my dad's a perfectionist. I'm like, what? I live in the country. If you just get it mowed, you're lucky. I don't care what direction you go. Oh, no, not Bob. It had to look like a major league baseball park and edging along it, just like first base. I thought, what goes on in the heart of a guy who calls himself a Christian and wants to serve the Lord? Aren't we thankful for people like this in our churches that are driven to want to serve God this way? And it's people like Bob that have made me want to be like that. It's the inspiration of serving God and having fun doing it is what drives a person to think, hey, you know what? I like doing that. I like serving God with that kind of an attitude. That's what it should be, isn't it? That's what it ought to be like. I mean, many people are problem finders but not very many people are problem fixers. A lot of people are takers, but a lot of people aren't givers. Bob would walk up and if you'd say, hey, Bob, or something, what what is it? What is it? I'll be right on it. I love a good challenge. Give it to me and I'll dive in. I mean, and he would get a group of guys and they would go after it. His job, he worked at the Tweco Corporation in Wichita, because one of our elders was the chairman, they make the MIG gun for the MIG welder. Um, And his job was making welding equipment. And he used to be a race car mechanic. But um, I feel what he teaches people is that when you would ask him, why do you approach everything working for the church to build up the body of Christ like this. He said, I'm happy to be a Christian and it's the least I can do for God for what he did for me. What did Mike say in the scripture? We were imprisoned by our sin. Let me summarize it. And Jesus came and opened the jail cell door and he let us free. He ransomed us. He paid the fee to set us free and Jesus set us free from our prison cell and he put himself in the cell and died in that cell in our place that gives you something to be excited about when somebody sets you free from the bondage of sin and that's how Bob felt about it I've been set free and I'm going to have a good time And I'm going to thank God for all that he's done for me by giving back to him the very best that I have. Wherever if I work on vehicles or work on the church or help the kids or cook for the kids, I'm going to give God my very best because he set me free. I had no hope and he gave me hope. I didn't have a life and God gave me a life. And Bob wanted to thank him by how he served the Lord. Isn't that cool? It's not just about service. And and I'm going to tell you something. A lot of people start the race, but not everybody finishes. Bob George, um, he he was steadfast. This, This is every week, you guys. This is every month. This is every year. This is his son on the cover of this magazine. Every week, I don't do very many commercials. Every week we have these magazines out here, they're free. A lot of topics you're always asking me about, they're in these magazines. Uh, Scripture studies, Bible studies, questions, theological. Get them and read them because a lot of the answers you're looking for are in here. His son Rusty, 
is the minister of a great big church in Southern California. When Rusty came up to me, he was about sixth grade. And he said, I want to work in junior church. I had about 120 kids in junior church, first through sixth grade. Rusty said, I want to preach to the first through third graders every Sunday, him and Steve Myers. And I said, okay, Rusty, I need workers. He came in with the same attitude as his dad. He had a three-piece suit on, had his Bible. I'm the preacher of the first through third graders, and you kids better sit down and remember it. They're like, who is this guy? Yeah, he took it just like who had been training him, his dad. Bob had trained him. He came into junior church every week, and he listened and learned from his dad, and now he's a minister of a great big church in California that's changing lives all over Southern California. And who taught him how to be that way? His dad. Isn't that cool? Because his dad had a servant's heart. And his son saw that servant's heart and thought, I want to serve like my dad serves. And it went on to something else. When Bob George passed away, they had moved to Joplin because his son went to school at Ozark Christian College. And they started attending the church there out by the college, College Heights Christian Church. Bob was in charge of the coffee. You should ask the minister there. He said, you've never seen a coffee shop at a church like we have in Joplin after Bob George got done with it. You, it he said, there's coffee shops at the shopping mall that aren't that good. He said, he would watch you drink it like good coffee, right? Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, and we got to be at his funeral. And when I think of guys like Bob George, this is what I think of. In the Hall of Fame of Faith, chapter 11, in the book of Hebrews, it's talking about the faith of great people. But this is the verse that stands out to me. It says, all these people were still living by faith when they died. All these people were still living by faith when they died. Hey, listen, a lot of people become Christians when they're little. A lot of people become Christians. Uh, I, I, I remember Trent and I had this discussion one time because meeting Trent, we got to talking. Trent, go, Trent went to church more as a little kid than I did. We got to talking about all the people that influenced him as a young boy. And man, a lot of people in life, it seems like you meet a lot of people. Oh yeah, I used to go to church. I used to do this. Why don't they anymore? A lot of people start the race, but not everybody finishes. There's a lot of things in life that seem to somehow get involved in us and we don't end up finishing the race. Even in the book of Galatians, Paul says, who was it that cut in on you to keep you from finishing the race? You were doing such a great job. Who was that? Oh man, listen, I used to be a youth minister. You didn't tell me nothing. You could have 40 kids in a room and, and all of them studying the Bible, have the best Bible study in the world. And all of a sudden, a new girl moves into town and goes to our church and comes to the youth group, and she's really good looking, and now every boy in the room. And all the girls are angry at her, you know, who's the new girl? How come all the guys are looking at her? I mean, all the teaching I'd done for a whole year just got thrown out the window. That girl has more power over every boy in that room than anything I'd tried to do in two years. Yeah, things happen in life, don't they? There's distractions. 
to keep us from finishing. And what I love about Bob George, listen, it didn't matter what year, what day, the day of his funeral, he was still being Bob, serving the Lord with ministers laughing about it at his funeral. See, that's where it really matters. It's not so much how you start, how are you going to finish. Hey, any of you that have, I've been married for 40 years. And you know what? I'm a much better husband today than I was when I started. I fully, completely repent. Okay? My wife is my best friend. I wouldn't have told you that the first year we got married. It's an adjustment. (laughs) If you want to stay married. Well, you know, I I mean, you come home from the honeymoon and you get home and you you think, hey, do you you want to go throw the football around? You, You want to play catch? You want to go shoot the bow? How about we go rope the dummy or... No. Hey, how about we go to Dillard's? What? Go to Dillard's? What, and look at perfume? Look at lipstick? No. Yeah, Jeremiah's like, no. But Jeremiah, you better listen to this. You know, and... and, you know, I knew nothing about women, and, you know, and I had a mother and a sister and, and all those kind of things, but, oh my goodness, it was an adjustment period. And when you come into Christianity, God is asking us to change our lives, change our attitudes, change our behavior, change our language, change where we go, change what we read, change what we watch, change who we date, change all the and man we're just wow we're we're fighting it we're fighting it you see what i loved about guys like bob george he had he had a past but he had a fun christian life changing and he taught other people hey if you become a christian you can have fun serving the lord i love serving the lord they'd sit in the kitchen and men would be at a prayer breakfast and they'd be back here giggling and they'd be back here telling, oh man, I can flay a fish so fast, I can flame, throw him in the water and watch him swim away. What, you guys? What are you talking about in there? I mean, they had all kinds, of, but they would grin at the guy. What are you grinning at everybody for? Because we put a bunch of red pepper in that gravy. <laughs> We're seeing just to, before you guys go to work today. We don't want you falling asleep at work. You know, they just, they just had a lot of fun being Christians. And the young men in our church saw that, hey, I can change my life. I can have fun being a Christian and be like those guys. It doesn't have to be dull or drab to be a Christian man. You can have fun living the Christian life, and it can be a great time. And you can influence your children. I mean, listen... I I was proud to see John get baptized. Uh, I'm proud that he's the quarterback on our high school football team. When I was a little kid, we always had our own game going behind the stadium. We never saw the adult game. We had our own game going on back in the back. But every one of us wanted to be John. I mean, to little kids, that's big stuff. And they, they, they watch. They watch what we say. They watch what we do. And we can have a great influence in their life if we're a Christian. We can lead them in so many good directions. And, and Bob George, the people in the church, man, listen, there's people that come up here and work at this church, you probably don't know who they are. And they love you guys. And they do it because they love you and that they love the Lord. And, and they're not looking for thank yous. They're not looking for a pat on the back. But, but they do a lot so that we can have a wonderful service and have a chance to share the Christ with someone 
that might be listening. And I'm so thankful for the Bob Georges in the world that even the day that they died, they're as faithful as the day that they became Christian. You know, not everybody can say that. There's a lot of people that start things, but they don't finish them very well. You know? And that, that, is, that is a powerful challenge. That I will be steadfast all of these years. As we wind this down this morning, praise team gets ready to come. High school football season is upon us. It's one of those fun times in every community. It's something you only get to do once in life. To be a part of it, it's a fun thing. Um, I, I don't know how you were growing up. I can only explain how I was. Uh, not only did we become in the back our own game, what got better is when it was an opportunity for us to be in the position of actually wearing a uniform and being on a team and not playing in the back anymore. And for me, I didn't just want to wear a uniform or be, be on a team. That, that wasn't good enough for me. I was on number one offense, number one defense, goal line offense, goal line defense, punt, punt return, kick, kick return. I, I, wanted to be in, I wanted to be involved in making the decision on who wins. I mean, if, if you would, I'm, the, I'm a competitive enough athlete that if you put me on a team and give me a uniform and I'm not playing, then I might as well just go home. That, that's how competitive I was. I mean, my dad said, well, are you mad? Because I, I want to be involved in who decides on who's going to win. I don't want to just be a part of something. I want to I decide the outcome. I mean, I was driven that way, and most good athletes are. Um, and it, it's kind of, but then I learned as a, as a young person, here's the deal. Okay, that's great that you want to be that way. But you're going to have to show up and you're going to have to practice. And you're going to have to go to school. And you're going to have to make passing grades while you're at school. And you're not going to have to be in trouble. And, it, and in the school where I was, growing up, was a big football town. If you got in trouble in the summer, you couldn't play football in the fall. Even though you weren't in school. So you were a Cleveland Tiger the whole time that you were a Cleveland Tiger and there was honor and respectability that comes with that in the community. If you violate that, you don't get to play. Yeah, there, there was a pressure, but I, I wanted that. And it made you achieve, and if you weren't good enough, and the other thing is an athlete, you can want to do all you, but you have to execute. I mean, it's just like I heard a guy say about major league, minor league baseball players. There's a lot of great baseball players in minor league baseball. What's the difference between them and the guys who play every day on television? I'll tell you what it is. Consistency. Execution. Minor league players can't do it every day. You can't be good once a month. You can't be good once a week. These guys can be good every day. That's the difference. If you're wondering, that's the difference. And in Christianity, it's not good enough for be a Christian once a month. It's not good enough to just serve the Lord once a year. God wants us to be a Christian and be a Bob George every day of our life. We ought to get up every morning and think, man, it's exciting to be a Christian today. It's fun to serve the Lord today. It's fun to live today, to take breath. I want to bless somebody today. Let's give God 100% of what we got every day. He's the one that came to the jail cell and unlocked the door and let you live. 
It's the least I can do by thanking him with how I serve him. Isn't it? And I ought to have a lot of fun doing it. And I ought to execute my task as a Christian like a champion. Because Jesus gave me everything. I owe him to give him everything that I have. And I appreciate the Bob Georges and the servant leaders in our church who work to make this a great place for everybody. They've done an outstanding job, but there's a whole bunch of people that need to get some work gloves and go to work and be consistent every day and every year serving the Lord with a great attitude so that they can see that You know, because one of the things John told me, and John, I'll quit picking on you after today. You're a good guy. He said, I wanted to be baptized here because I wanted Junior to see it. He looked up to Cindy's dad and lives out there. They're neighbors. And I thought, isn't that neat? He's a young boy, wants to serve the Lord, but Junior had had an influence in his life. There's a young person watching every one of you that you have an influence in their life. And by how you live may determine whether they want to be a Christian someday, just like John did. And hopefully they will because of your influence. But maybe this morning you have a decision you need to make as we stand and sing. You've been thinking about it, praying about it. Feel free to come forward as we stand and sing.